Hey there, everyone, and welcome in to Better Advertising with Better Media. We are here for episode two of our DSP series. I'm your host, Justin Knuckles, and I'm sitting alongside my co-host for this series, Adam Malott. What's going on, Adam? Hey, Justin. Pleasure to be recording another episode with you, man. We're here early in the week bringing some DSP knowledge on everyone. So in last episode, we talked about what we were looking forward to talking about in today's episode. Things like awareness versus remarketing and how you optimize for buyer intent across the, the buyer journey. We also looked ahead to creative best practices for targeting different stages of the funnel. And then lastly, we mentioned that we would wanted to dive into audiences, the first party capabilities and the custom abilities you have. Today, we, have, we actually wanted to touch on just audiences. It's really a foundational point for DSP. And I think once you understand that, you really see the value in every capability around DSP. So Adam, let's kind of bring everyone into the audience capabilities that DSP has, what types of audiences we have, everything from first party to third party. Let's just start high level. What do we have available? Sure. I'm going to keep this high level. You know, we could definitely rabbit hole on the audience capabilities in DSP. And I think that's, you know, ultimately what's attracting a lot of endemic and non-endemic brands to the platform, right? The fact that we have first party audience audiences provided directly from Amazon. So any of our behavioral lifestyle in markets, demographic based audiences, new to category audiences, et cetera, are all 1P audiences provided directly from the source, right? We also have third party audiences available that are supplied by other data providers, right? Directly in the DSP as well. And to your point, Justin, we also have custom audience capabilities. We can run custom audiences of those who have viewed a particular listing over a customized look back window. Same thing with purchasers, those who have landed on brand stores or brand store sub pages, those who have engaged with competitor listings, all sorts of things. So really the, the capabilities are generally endless when it comes to, when it comes to audience creation, that's where I'll leave that. Yeah. And we'll also get into a little bit more in this episode about audience inclusions and exclusions, because to Adam's point, as granular as you can be with audiences, it's even more powerful when you can stack those and say, I want to make sure I'm hitting this audience, but make sure you're not serving my ad to this other group of people. So we'll get into the exclusion inclusion capabilities here in just a bit. But as you were saying, it's not just about bringing in your own custom audiences and slicing the data how you want, but actually other data providers, other D providers port data into DSP for, for audience abilities. So We'll get into that in just a little bit, but you know, providers like Experian, Oracle provide audience data for us to be able to target people that are in market or lifestyle for certain types of products. Or, I mean, I was looking at one just a couple minutes ago, people that live within a certain proximity of a Krispy Kreme, like you can be as granular as you want to be with these audience capabilities. That's dangerous. So I think we've teased audiences enough. Let's, let's bring them into the first party capabilities that Amazon gives us in DSP, Adam. Let's talk on lifestyle down to demographics and everything in between, all the levers Amazon gives us. Sure. So, you know, pretty, pretty high level talking point there, right? And what any advertiser or really any brand owner would walk into if they were to dive into the audience section of DSP, you know, it'd probably be a bit overwhelmed, right? Whoa, there's a lot going on here. A lot of different levers I can pull, a lot of different buttons I can press, right? So, you know, we, I will stress the fact that, of course, advertisers and brands really need to hone in their targeting strategy and, and just generally explore what's going on within Amazon's provided audiences and the DSP to really grasp what's, what's you know, what's able to be used there on a brand-to-brand -brand basis, right? But as far as just general differences, you know, I'm going to start with just Amazon's 1P and uh, lifestyle, right? So, you know, there's going to be a lot of different options we have for lifestyle audiences. These are audiences that are more tailored around a specific, it could be a life event, right? Such as a marriage or, or uh, somebody who just had a baby or bought a house or, or what have you, right? So a bit more top funnel, a bit more behavioral. So the, the capabilities there are pretty, pretty deep. Yeah, to pick up where you left off, Adam, I'm showing my screen here for those that are watching us on YouTube or have the ability to, to watch us and what we're showing on our screens. But touching on those lifestyle and in-market audiences provided by Amazon. Now, what we're looking at here on our screen, if you can see, is basically the the shopping shopping market of all the audiences you can go through provided by DSP. 
So what we're seeing here in this column called data provider is Amazon provided first party data. So just like we talked about in our last episode on D- or on the podcast here, we were talking how Amazon first and foremost is a data company. They're second to that a, a marketplace. So they know buyer habits, trends, and they know where people make purchases before they lead on to the next purchase. So this is really cool to look at the lifestyle in market audiences to Adam's point and say, People that are who people whose shopping activities indicate they are likely to purchase salt and scrub or salt and salt substitutes, excuse me, or people who shopping activities indicate they're likely to purchase floor standing fountains. So you can get, as we've said many times before, very granular in this, but we also get the forecasted daily reach. So Amazon having it be their first party data tells us exactly how big this audience is and how, how much people you can actually reach per day. So this is really powerful here, looking across these. Obviously, not everything is going to be applicable to you, your brand, your targeting and audiences. But the point stands, there's definitely people to be targeting in here that you could bring into your aisle and educate them on you know, why they need your product and why it more than likely makes sense that they're going to purchase this in the future. So Adam, I'll throw it back to you. Anything to add on the in-market lifestyle audiences and segments here? Um, no, you know, I think you hit the nail on the head, Justin. And the only other thing I would add as far as in market is concerned is analyze the, the, how specific the audience is that you're considering going after, right? I think in terms of uh, a DSP strategy plan that we're putting together currently for a brand in the boating and outdoors category, right? And we're sifting through in market audiences there and we're finding you know, there, there are high level audiences, like those who are in market for hunting fishing products, right? And there's also those who are in market for outboard boat motors. So obviously one is much more specific than the other. And there may be some overlap between the two, right? It is the advertiser's job to ultimately figure that out and, and, and drill down in terms of targeting strategy, but definitely jump into those overlap reports in, in 1P audiences, depending on the, the specific audiences you're considering targeting. Now, I think it's fair to say and kind of warn our listeners, Adam, that these audiences in market lifestyle audiences are a bit mid funnel, higher funnel. They're not the highest purchase intent. You can't serve one or two ads of these people and expect a great row ads out of them, but they they fuel the flywheel of getting people into your remarketing campaigns, getting people to search your brand name on ad or in ads and come up in PPC. So it's it's a segment that leads to future purchases versus Definitely. these other audiences, which we'll get into like custom capabilities and so on. But before we get to custom, any other first party audiences, demographics, lookalikes, I think lookalike is one that we could probably dive into quite a bit. Nothing I'd specifically like to hit on. I will mention that I'm a big fan of the new to category audiences directly in, in, in the DSP. And, you know, I may be getting my ha- ahead of myself here a bit, but the fact that, you know, we have purchaser exclusion capabilities combined with new to category, first party audience targeting, right? You can only imagine how powerful that can be for getting your brand and your products in front of the right subset of customers who are, you know, shopping within the category or, or maybe browsing within the category and haven't purchased from a specific brand. So pretty cool. Absolutely. One other thing I wanted to point out, having brought up the lookalike audiences is the, the value to both endemic and non-endemic sellers. So obviously this makes a ton of sense if you're an Amazon seller and have your product listed on amazon.com, but the lookalike audiences is again, a data set provided directly from Amazon, but this is really helpful for people that are non-endemic brands, right? We can see lookalike audiences for people that are interested in Toyota Camry accessories possibly. So if you're a seller who has products that are accessories for a Toyota Camry or a certain make and manufacturer, these could be great audiences for you. So I think the lookalike audience is a great thing to layer into your upper mid funnel strategies, such as the in market and lifestyle audiences we've been talking about till now. But lookalike just gives you an incremental reach, right? These are people you're likely not already targeting in somewhere across your funnel that would be good to bring in and start educating them on for future purchases. So cool. I think that maybe bleeds it dry on the first party audiences outside of, of course, demographic, but anything we're missing before we jump ahead. No, I think, I think we're good here. You know, we hit, we hit lifestyle, life event, in-market behavioral, lookalike, demographic, specific instances of in-market, like new to category or, or, you know, browsing for X product or, or what have you. So again, like you had mentioned, Justin, those audiences 
become immensely more powerful as you layer them. And especially as you lay an exclusion, right? View, whether it be viewed through purchase, purchase exclusion, et cetera, for your own brand, but definitely a lot of power and, and granularity within, within those capabilities. 100%. So as we said, those are very much mid to upper funnel strategies. Not that you may not see some great ROAS out of one or two of those at some point in time. But I think the highest purchase intent is going to be those custom capabilities where you can set a specific ASIN and say, people that have looked at this listing in the last 15 days, if you want to be that specific, but excluding people who have purchased in the last 10 days, if you want it to be that specific. I think that's where you really get the high buyer intent power out of DSP. So let's talk on that. What custom capabilities do we have to set within that segment of audiences? Sure. So we have product specific custom audience creation capabilities with directly within the DSP. And in a nutshell, what that means is that I can take an ASIN or a, a group of ASINs, right? Whether it be my own brand or a competitor brand or a, co a combination of competitor brands, I can input those ASINs into the DSP and say, Hey, I want an audience of those who have viewed these products over the last seven days, or I want an audience of those who have searched for these products over the last 30 days or purchased these products over the last 365 days. So I just see you, you pulled it up, Justin. Essentially, the segments we have in terms of capabilities at the product level are going to be product purchase, product views, similar product views, subscribe and save. And I believe there's one I'm missing. Is it product searches? Yes. Yeah, so these are where you can get as granular as you, your audience size can be, right? We we would love to set our remarketing campaigns to be those that looked at our, our listing in the last one day, but you have to have a certain audience size to make these capable to be targeted. So, but we, we've seen these be successful as people that have looked at our listings in the last seven days, if not maybe even more short, short term than that, but doing some seven day product views and talking to that exclusion inclusion point where you can exclude people who have already purchased your product, um, or you can target people that are searching for your product, but have not viewed your product yet. Um, this is where the inclusion exclusion part of it. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know. I'm a kind of a nerdy stats guy. I love to think of this like a, like a Venn diagram. And I think that's a perfect way to visualize this is making sure that you're targeting certain people and excluding a certain subset of those to be as precise as you can. And right. looking ahead, that's where creatives, you can really tailor your creatives to who you're targeting. But Great. let's not get too ahead of ourselves and let's stick on the cap custom capabilities. I know I got ahead of ourselves there on the product audiences we can build, but Adam, let's walk through some of these other custom audiences that we can build. People who engage with whole brands on Amazon, people who engage with a storefront on Amazon. We have a lot of capabilities here for custom audience building. Sure. So, you know, one, one subset that we're testing is those who have engaged with particular Amazon stores, excluding one full year of, pa of brand past purchasers, right? And that quite literally means, hey, anybody who has landed on our storefront, who has not purchased in the last year, we're going to hit them again with a remarketing ad. And that's, you know, Justin, to your point where you can get incredibly specific in terms of your messaging and the creative. And I don't mean to pivot here, but I do believe it's important. You know, we can just get very, very specific in terms of what audiences we we are going after and the information that we're serving to them essentially. You know, I would want to tailor my advertisement to those who have landed on a store page but never purchased from us a bit more differently than I would somebody who maybe purchased from us a year ago and needs a gentle reminder to purchase again, right? So there's different intents the way the way you manipulate DSPs audiences and exclusion capabilities and you need to make sure that you're creatives are in line with with that sort of facet of DSP. And I I will just mention that as a very important factor here before we ju jump into all of these audiences. But Justin, to your point, you know, there is there is a massive amount of of targeting capability here in the DSP. Our bread and butter generally is in the product audiences, brand audiences, and then I would say ads tag, purchase and event based audiences here and there. Essentially what that means is you can uh, place an ads tag on particular web pages and, and ultimately track activity, right? So we can do things like remarket to those who have landed on a web page, but maybe not landed on the thank you page or the purchase page, right? 
Justin, I'll, I'll, I'll pass it off to you here, man. This, this section is largely a monster, right? So yeah, there's, there's a ton of capabilities in there that I don't think any DSP advertiser could say that they've, they've mastered and maximized every part of the custom audience capabilities within Amazon DSP. So that's just us being honest. So to that point of the, the thank you page and what you were just referring to, are these the third party audiences that you're bringing into Amazon or are these things that you have inherently within Amazon DSP? So technically that would be third party. Essentially go that way. Yeah. Yeah. We have, you know, this is, it's a, it's a funny line, right? We have capabilities to take the tag directly out of the advertiser in DSP and place that on the header of a website. And then essentially what we're doing is, is remarketing to that specific traffic, right? So in that instance, I would classify that as 3P, but drum roll, we do have 3P audiences available directly in DSP2 or audiences that are not provided by Amazon, they're provided by additional data providers. Justin, I know you were referencing a, a ton of really cool examples, very, very specific to you know, brands and categories. So we'll kick that off to you. Yeah, this is something we touched on a little bit earlier in this episode, but on the third party audiences, we we obviously have mentioned that you can bring in via pixels and hashed audiences, your own website data and, and owned and your own data. But what we also have within here is again, data provided by not Amazon, by third parties like Experian, Polk, uh, MasterCard, and they may or may not be relevant to you. Again, things like people in market for aftermarket auto parts, people in households that are likely auto parts buyers, that may be very, very relevant to a certain brand or seller out there. But again, that's not data provided by Amazon, but that's also not data that you had to bring into Amazon. This is data already provided by Polk directly here within the Amazon DSP. So I think that's, Adam, to your point, what is super valuable about these third-party audiences outside of just Amazon's owned and operated, which is super powerful, but this is even more reason if you're not an Amazon seller to be within Amazon DSP. Sure. I am running or planning a test right now, a streaming TV and online video test for a pretty large makeup CPG beauty brand that we mm -hmm. work for and, or that we work with rather. And one of the large areas of focus, right, is going to be those three P audience segments. What we're actively looking to achieve is to funnel new to brand customers directly into our brand, right? And get them in, sort of into that, into that funnel in terms of customer activity and ultimately purchase. And we're leaning heavily into, you know, product audiences, product specific audiences, such as views, purchase audiences, those who have landed on specific brand stores and perhaps haven't purchased, et cetera. And we're also climbing up the funnel. And, and really hammering those 1P audiences in terms of interest, right? Those who are interested in makeup and beauty, those demographic specific audiences, right? Obviously makeup is, is uh, and beauty is more key to, uh, you know, a female audience, of course, younger, et cetera, et cetera. So we're using AMC for a lot of those insights. But something that we're leaning into heavily is also 3P, right? As we sort of explore DSP's capabilities and, and learn what works and what doesn't, what's worth testing, what's worth not. Um, we find that there is a ton of granularity in those 3P audiences. As an example, um, one of the audiences that we're targeting are frequent high spenders at Ulta, right? And essentially what we can do is target that audience. Okay, hey, if you're, a, if you're classified by this data provider as a high spender at Ulta, we would want to go after you as long as you haven't purchased from our brand, right? And that's mm -hmm. where the exclusion capabilities come into play. So I do think 3P audiences in, in the DSP aren't talked about enough. Now, keep in mind, you know, the beauty of, of DSP is that Amazon does provide 1P. So it's, it's extremely powerful to utilize those audiences. But just for additional levers to pull within the platform on a brand to brand basis, I would definitely explore the 3P subsets. Absolutely. And one thing that you made mention of that we should definitely remind everybody listening is this gets really powerful when you do have AMC, when you can see which audiences are, are performing better, which audiences are leading to future purchases from different audiences. It really helps piece together the customer journey for you and visualize where you need to be spending to lead to 
more profitable sales wherever the audience is, whichever segment strategy that is for you. Make sure that you're feeding those. So AMC is something I'm sure we're going to dive into in this series at some point, but as you're strategizing which audiences to, to make up your strategies with, AMC is likely going to be a, a very good source of truth for you in this. 100%, 100%. I think we, I won't dive into that subject of too much because I think that we could spend another hour oh, yeah. speaking on AMC and, and just the capabilities and how we how we layer in AMC insights with our PPC and DSP strategies. Justin, one question I did have for you. You know, we've talked about a lot of different audience capabilities, right? And a lot of yep. um, a lot of targeting strategies. You know, at the product level, brand level, etc. Are there any low hanging fruit audiences or, or subsets of audiences, right? Like a, like a view through and exclusion that you got that we generally test across brands as, as sort of a blanket test. Is there anything that you recommend for brands to get yeah. started in terms of targeting strategy? Yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll give two, maybe three answers here for those that are wanting to get started with a DSP and they're just wanting to test this out and say, does, does it even make sense to expand on this, to, to build a full funnel strategy? The easiest, lowest hanging fruit is typically your pro if you're an Amazon seller, is your product views excluding your purchasers. It's the most tried and true form of remarketing. Those typically work. Now, if you have a repeatable purchase item, think something you can subscribe to, then maybe you do want to include those prior product purchasers. Someone that bought maybe 45 days ago but hasn't purchased in the last month, you know, catching this like 15-day window of they should have refilled by now, but they haven't. So that's a really low hanging fruit if you're a subscribe and save type audience or business. Now, for those that are looking to really grow their reach, you know, we work with some advertisers that they're already doing inline advertising. They're already running TV ads on some of the biggest channels on TV. So what are they looking for? What's the value in Amazon DSP for them? It's the incremental reach. It's those, everything we've been talking about till now, the in, mar in markets, the lifestyles, the behaviorals, right? Like Amazon knows more than likely what our next purchase is going to be before any one of us knows what our purchase is going to be. <laughs> so let's trust that data and let's serve ads to those that are likely going to buy our brand, our product in the future or competitors and try to steal that customer from the competitor. So I'll say those are the two lowest hanging fruits, depending on what your, your goal is, right? Are you trying to grow scale, brand name awareness, so to speak, or are you looking to really maximize your sales and your your efforts on PPC remarketing sure. on one hand and tapping into that first party audience data for in market and lifestyle, I think is the second big value. So sure. Uh, those are great call outs. And one, one aspect of DSP, I do want to mention, right. You know, Justin with, with your details into, into those targeting strategies, right. We can very clearly see how DSP would PPC in the long term, right? Or at least your your full funnel strategy in terms of awareness down to down to loyalty. Now we need to get very specific in terms of DSP intent and what we expect from the platform before we go and test, right? You know, as a perfect example, we see, you know, a lot a lot of brands who maybe not, aren't specifically educated on on DSP's capabilities and how it functions, right? And what they expect is to come in here and test these 1P audiences and see massive sales increases, you know, within 30, 60, 90 days, right? And that's not the case. The case is essentially DSP is acting as, you know, I, I like to refer to it as sort of like a little brother, although I think at some point it will become the big brother of, of search. You know, it's a complementary platform, right? It's working to take all of the things that you're doing organically and in search, right? And, and hit those, those specific audiences again. So you know, we need to be realistic with the return that we get per different parts of the marketing funnel and ultimately customer journey. As you had said, Justin, I wouldn't expect, you know, a first party in market segment to drive a $10 ROAS for a CPG company. Um, and on the other side, right, I wouldn't expect a remarketing audience to drive 90% new to brand customers. So I think a lot of, I think there's a lot of education when it comes to DSP and, and ultimately learning on and how to test the platform and what to expect uh, when pairing DSP with PPC ultimately. Yeah, I agree. And it's what we're here to do in all future episodes is continue that education on DSP. So stick around, continue listening to this series. I loved your analogy. The way I think of DSP is really like 
fanning a flame, right? Like you have to have a good fire. You have to have a good flame going before fanning. It's going to spread the fire, get it hotter. So if you have a, if you have a bad product, if you have a bad brand, it's DSP is only going to exaggerate those problems. I, we need to get the the foundational e-commerce criteria hit first before we can really sure. unlock DSP. So wanted to reiterate that to your point, Adam. Well, I think that covers it today for, you know, the intros into audiences and why audiences are so dang powerful in Amazon DSP. But before we cut it here, Adam, anything to add? No, uh, if you're if you're curious to test DSP or you know would like to kind of see how we do things here at Better Media, feel free to reach out directly to myself or Justin. This is one of our favorite subjects to divulge into and and, and sort through with with brands and advertisers alike. So, any questions, any recommendations, any feedback, we are all ears. Absolutely, and be sure to share this episode with any of your friends in the space that you know are running DSP or interested in DSP. Let's all learn together and and work on improving our brands up the funnel. So. Catch us next time on episode three, and we'll talk a little bit more on those custom creatives like Adam was talking about here, how to tailor your messaging to different segments of the funnel, these different audiences we've been talking about here. So making sure that your creatives and your messaging is actually moving someone along the journey, is actually educating them to purchase your product. So we'll talk about that next time in our episode, but till then, cheers and enjoy the rest of your week. Mm -hmm.